Y'all, I want that to be like my wake up music. Like, I mean, it just feels like cool, like, yeah, all right, this is good. Oh my gosh. Uh, I have to tell you though, every time I watch the, the bumper, for this, um, that we have for this series, it, it always makes me laugh because I remember back to our creative planning meeting where we were talking about, you know, how, you know, what is this video is gonna look like? And one of um, the guys on the team said, hey, you know what? We could, um, like, I got a buddy that has a forge and like we can go out to his, uh, his place and we can film it ourselves. And I may or may not have actually threatened bodily harm if they did that without me. Because it's so cool. Like I, like a couple weeks ago, Mark told you, I am a massive fan of the show Forged in Fire, which is, I'm not sure it's a pastoral thing, but anyway, uh, it's so cool. Because you, ha you ha they have these like metal smiths, these blacksmiths that come together and you, they're given raw material and they have to use the forge and they have to like create this in incredible piece of art that, yeah, is a weapon, but anyway. Um, and it's just cool. I thought, oh my gosh, I want to see a forge in action. Action. Like, I want to see that live. And it worked out because we actually, look at me, I got to use it, which is very cool and also showed me I really need to work on my upper body strength because it's really hard, but it's so cool. You put this metal in and it heats up and then you pull it out and then you can um, you can shape it with a, with a hammer and it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. But what's really neat is that what you see in, a, in the forging process, it's really about how to take raw material and transform it into something that has purpose, something that um, is what it's designed to be. And I thought, that's, that is what we're talking about here. That's the worship series. It's the art of formation, how are we transformed? How are we formed into something, someone with a purpose? And so we're in Daniel and we are looking at this series through the lens of the book of Daniel. And if you've been with us, a couple weeks ago we started it, Mark taught on the very first chapter of Daniel and we're introduced to not only Daniel but his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what we find out is that they have been taken from their homeland and they've been taken to Babylon, but the truth in that message was that you can live in Babylon and not be conformed by the world. And the key verse was 1-8, where it said that Daniel resolved not to defile himself. So we learned how we can uh, live in the world but not be uh, transformed or conformed to the world. And then last week, as we got into the second chapter, we learned a little bit more about King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the king of Babylon, and, and basically he's a hothead. Right? I mean, he creates chaos, he creates um, crisis, and so he has this whole thing where he, he grab, grabs his people as astrologers, enchanters, magicians, he's like, look, I've had a dream, I want you to tell me what the dream is, I want you to interpret it, and by the way, if you can't do it, I'm just, I'm, basically, I'm gonna kill you. And so Daniel and his friends, instead of panicking in this environment of chaos and crisis, they actually go to prayer. And God gives them everything that they need. He's this non-anxious presence in this beautiful time. And, and they get to show King Nebuchadnezzar what it is to live a life that is dedicated to the one almighty God. And so this week, we're going into Daniel chapter three. And these friends go from the frying pan into the fire, like literally, and there are two truths that are true for this chapter, for Daniel, for his friends, but they're the same truths for us. And so this is what I want us to look at today. I want us to know and realize that we are formed in the fire and we are forged in our friendships. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up Daniel chapter three. And I will tell you that some time has passed between what happened at the end of chapter two to what happens in chapter three. And scholars kind of debate like how much time, but we're talking 10 years, 15 years. It's been a long time. And what has happened is that King Nebuchadnezzar has put Daniel and his friends actually in 
uh, positions of authority. They are in Babylon, having authority over Babylonians. And so this is what happens. I want you to go to verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, you know, that's pretty much what our band plays right here, right? All kinds of music. So when you hear this music, you have said, we have to fall down and worship this huge golden image that you have made of yourself. And if we don't do this, King, you have told us that you are going to throw us into the blazing furnace. But guess what? Hey, King, you know what? There are some Jews here that you have set in positions of authority that you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And by the way, if you don't know who I'm talking about, let me just call them out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, why would they do this? Why would astrologers come forward to denounce the Jews? Well, remember what I was saying in last chapter when King Nebuchadnezzar was asking his astrologers, magicians, enchanters to do this thing they couldn't. We bring Daniel and his friends. They can do it. So they're basically like co-workers. And he's jealous because he's a Babylonian. And they're like, wait a minute, here are these Jews and they're getting put into positions of authority. Like they're not happy about this. So he's probably been looking for a time when he can discredit him and ha, here it is because he knows there's no way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to actually bow down and worship this massive gold image that the king has put together. And he's right. They're not going to. But why? Why wouldn't he? Okay, let's just put yourself in the shoes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like you've been serving for a time. Your king has asked you to do something really silly, but you're like, you know what? I could just kind of bow down and I could pretend. They're gonna think I'm worshiping the golden image, but what I'm really doing is I'm praying to my own God. Like that seems like that would be easier for my life, if I would just kind of pretend to go along. But that is not what they're made of. That is not what they're going to do because they grew up hearing the stories of how Moses went onto Mount Sinai, how God had given the commandments and said, this is how I'm gonna protect you. This is how you're gonna be my people. All you have to do is follow these commandments. But they know that if they do this, this breaks the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Because if we put something, if we put anything above God, then we're gonna lose ourselves. Like there is no way that we are going to be transformed into the people that we are created to be if we allow something to go above our belief in God. See, just like metal, when metal is heated up into a forge, if, if there is nothing that happens to it, if you just let it kind of just sit in its environment, it just sort of melts, it does nothing. But in the hands of a master craftsman, it can be designed and formed and transformed into something that has a beautiful purpose. And so King Nebuchadnezzar hears that this is not gonna happen. He's like, I cannot believe it. I've put them in charge of something. Like, this is terrible. Let's bring them in front of me. Hey, guys, seriously, is it true? Like, you are not going to bow down? This is a beautiful image of me. I'm thinking it looks good. Surely you're going to do this after I've done all the stuff for you? I mean, come on. And he gets so mad. He's like, and by the way, you know I'm throwing you into a fire, right? Into the furnace if you do not do this. And I love their response. Look in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Really? I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Like they don't want to 
defend themselves. They don't wanna speak up against this is what I believe. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I, if I put something out on social media, you know, and I'm like, hey, and praise the Lord, love this, and someone comes at me and wants to attack me, the very first thing I wanna do is defend myself. I mean, the first thing I want to do is, let me just tell you exactly why I believe this. And, and surely, this, surely, if I pour my heart out, this person is going to back down and say, oh, well, now I understand. No, no. They knew that it was just going to really put fuel in the fire, right? Now, as believers, do we need to be able to say what we believe and defend it? And, and Yes, absolutely. But remember, they have been serving the king for decades now. They know exactly who they're dealing with. And they know that their words are not going to change this king's mind. They know that the only thing that's going to change his mind is to see their God in action. So they're like, we're not going to defend ourselves. But let me tell you this. Verse 17, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, but even if he does not, that's key. If you have your Bible, underline that, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to worship the image of God that you have. Because we know what we stand for. We know what we're made of. We know what's important to us. How many of y'all know the story of Three Little Pigs? Remember that story? I mean, I'm a parent, so I've told this story like a hundred times. Let's see if we can walk through it together. The first little pig builds his house of what? Do you remember? Straw or hay, right? And then when the wolf comes and blows on the house, what happens to the house? Right, it crumbles, that's right. And the second pig builds his house out of sticks, or wood. But when the winds of the wolf come, what happens to that house? It goes down, right, that's right. But the third little pig builds his house of brick right, of something that is going to withstand the winds of the world. 1 Corinthians 3, I'm going to read you this passage from the voice um, version. There is, in fact, only one foundation, and no one can lay any foundation other than, the, than Jesus the anointed, as others build on the foundation, whether it's gold, silver, gemstones, wood, hay, straw, the quality of each person's work will be revealed in time as it is tested by fire. And if a man's work stands the test of fire, he will be rewarded. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that nothing was impossible with God knew that they had built their lives on the foundation of the one true God and knew that God could, could save them. But even if he didn't, even if he didn't, they were willing to trust him, to suffer, and to even die for what they believed. Now, did this change the king's mind? Did he go, oh, my goodness, well, that does sound like that makes sense. I think I'm going to change my mind completely. No. It did not. Uh, he was so infurious. Remember, he, he's a hothead, right? He was so furious that he's like, fine, I cannot believe you're going to do that. We're going to take the furnace. We're going to heat it seven times hotter. And you know what? Just for good measure, I'm going to bind you up, and then we're going to throw you in immediately. Now, I want you to imagine this. This is like a huge furnace. Now, these furnaces would have been built. The whole purpose of it was to smelt iron ore. So they would have this raw material, this iron ore. They'd put it into vessels. They would drop it in the big opening, 
into the furnace. And then there would be like these little like windows, these little openings in the, in the walls so that people, the workers could look and watch the process of what's happening. And then there would be a big door in the bottom that they could go in. And as the iron ore is smelted, as the impurities are taken away, and then you get that good iron, the wrought iron that's left over that they can use to uh, make something, they would go in this door to pull that out. So this is the furnace. And so they are, are dropping them in here. Now, just think, every time that we are put into a place of suffering, a place of just feeling the pressures of the world, it's a refining process. One of two things can happen. Either God can help take out the impurities in our life so that it leaves us stronger and able to be transformed into who we're called to be, or we're just gonna fall apart. Author Charles Swindoll says this, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. These three friends are in an impossible situation, but God gives them two things, two gifts, friendship and a fourth. When you and I are in the fire, when you and I are in a place in our lives where we are feeling the pressure, we have been given a gift by God and that secret weapon is friendship. I mean, think about it. When like the best things in your life happen or when the most horrible things in your life happen, what do you wanna do? You wanna go and call your friend. You wanna text your friend. Like, you can't believe what happened. Or you cannot believe what happened. Like you want that friend alongside you because God has given us community to support us, to comfort us. And through this relationship, we actually find that we are formed. God uses it to form who we are. Our friendships become the forge itself that shape us. I mean, think back. Think back to some of the people in your life. Like my guests, the, the ones that have really um, helped shape who you are today. I'm gonna guess that you've had some people come into your life as like mentors who wanna like pass on a legacy. Or you've had someone come in who's just been your comforter, who's, who's held your hand or held on to you during the worst times. Maybe you've even had someone come in who's challenged you to be better than you are or your champion to just go, yes, you can do this. Author Jonathan Holmes says this, friendships matter because they image God to a broken world. Think about that. Friendships matter because what happens in godly friendships, they show the world who God is and how God lives in and through us. Through our friendships, we can actually reflect the best characteristics of God, the love and the grace and the integrity and the compassion and the forgiveness, right? I mean, look back in scripture, how many amazing friendship stories are there in scripture like Joshua and Caleb who have to stand up and speak truth to crowd mentality, you have Paul who mentored Timothy to become this wonderful leader in the church. The paralytic who had his friends carry him to the feet of Jesus when he couldn't get there himself. David who had Nathan as the accountability partner and says, man, you have gotten off the rails. You have got to make better choices, come on. David also had Jonathan, who was his greatest champion, who said, I'm gonna stand beside you no matter what happens because I believe that what God is doing in your life, the gift of friendships, godly friendships, what a beautiful gift that God has given us. You know, there's a story, like one of my favorite friendship stories in, in um, the movies is in Fellowship of the Ring. Who knows Frodo and Sam? 
right? Frodo and Sam, who have to go on this impossible journey to the fires of Mordor. And so they all travel, and this is a pack of friends, but Frodo realizes that this is going to risk the lives of his friends, and so he doesn't want to do it, so he decides, I'm going to go off on my own. I'm not going to risk the lives of my friends. And Sam says, "Uh uh-uh, no, you don't. Our friendship is going to stand the test of time. Our friendship is not going to be broken. Our friendship is going to stand the fires of the world. I want you to watch this clip to see what a friendship looks like. Don't we all need a friend like Sam? Where do we get those friends? Where do we, where do we develop that kind of relationship? Here. Here. This is where God gives us a community of faith. God gives us a worship community. God has given us harvest home groups, small groups, soul sister groups. God has given us this place where we can find friends, this gift of friendship, people who aren't going to leave us, people who will carry us to the feet of Jesus when we can't get there ourselves. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this gift of friendship, but God also gave them another gift, and it was himself. Look at verse 24. Remember, they're in the furnace, and it says, then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, catch that, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. I see four. They were not alone. God had given them himself. Even King Nebuchadnezzar recognized it. Even he saw that God was able to break the the bounds that they had been tied up with. Even he could see that they were not alone. Read in Isaiah 43. See if this sounds familiar. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. No matter what we're facing, we are not alone. The fire that King Nebuchadnezzar thought would destroy them actually became the place where they all got to see God at work. Do you need to be reminded of that? Do you need to know that God is with you, that you're not alone? Do you need friendships like we're describing here? If so, I want to help you. This, I'm telling you, you are part of a church that will not leave you. We are a church that will stand with you no matter what you're doing. And if you need help finding community here, if you need help finding friendships and relationships, I want you to know that we we can help you. All you have to do, look, I'm like seriously putting this out here. You email me. You email this team, harvest at twmc.org. Super simple. We will help you find community here. We believe in it so much. We know that it's a gift of God. We know that it's important because we cannot live the life that we are meant to live if we do not have Jesus Christ as our Savior and we are not meant to live alone. And I want you to hear that and I want to help you if you need it. There's a song that we sing here a lot. It's called Another in the Fire. I love this song so much. It's very personal to me. Um, The chorus of this song reflects what we've been reading in Daniel and what we heard in Isaiah. And it says, "There'll, there'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should you ever need reminding how good you've been to me. If you just read the lyrics, it reminds us that we're not alone that God's with us, there's joy in the battle because he is there. Last year, I'm just gonna be super honest and transparent with you right now. Last year, 2019 was really rough for me. I had some high highs, 
I had some low lows, and I was really struggling with where I was supposed to be as a person, as a pastor. And so last fall, I had the opportunity to go to a conference that I love to go to. It's called New Room. Lo actually referenced it earlier. Um, but it's in Nashville, and we try and go every year. And what's really amazing is you're just in this room surrounded by people who love Jesus, who call out and, and pray to the Holy Spirit. And as I've been there before, I had heard God speak to me at these conferences before. And so as much as I was struggling, I wanted to go and I wanted to hear from God. So I specifically went with two prayers. And one of the prayers was, is it okay to stay? I wanted, still love, being here, being on staff here. But I was wrestling with a lot of opposition and doubt. And so I wasn't sure if God was maybe preparing me to move on to a different season. And so I wanted to know, did, did I need to prepare myself to leave or is it okay to, to want to stay? Because all I wanted was to be obedient to God. I didn't want to be disobedient. And so I went and I went to this conference with friends, um, some names that you probably would recognize like Mark Sorensen and Brent Parker. And there were some other friends there like Brenna Bullock and Lo Alleman, by the way, praise God, God brought him here on staff. Uh, Mark Swayze, some really good friends were there. And so the second day of the conference, we're in worship, I'm full worship mode, and they start singing the song, Another in the Fire. And I am singing, and I'm telling you, I hear God. I hear God's voice, and he gives me five words. And why do you worry? And why do you worry? And I knew it was God, because the tears start coming down, and the weight that I had been carrying was physically lifted off. I just took this deep breath, and I smiled, and I thought, that's amazing. God spoke to me. And as I prepared to go back to the um, hotel that night, I thought, ah, oh, so good that God spoke. What did that mean? I don't know. I was actually just looking for a yes or a no. And he said, and why do you worry? I'm like, huh. Okay, so I have another day. <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe this time I'll just pray for a little clarity. Like, Lord, what did that mean? Was it a yes or a no? And so the second, I mean, the next day, the third day of the conference, I'm again, I'm in this worship. I'm praying. I'm like, hey, God, remember? Remember that opposition? Remember that doubt? Remember the question? Like, is it okay? Can you just kind of clarify what you're trying to say to me? And um, they play the song again. Again, I hear the Lord speak. And this time he gave me six words. And he said, there's another in Oh, there's a friend in the fire. There's a friend in the fire. And I cannot really explain it to you, but there was this weird illumination. I was hyper aware of the fact that I had a friend standing next to me. And I knew it was God. And I knew God was saying, you are not alone. I know what you're going through. I know what you're dealing with, but you aren't alone. I'm with you, so you don't have to worry. And you're not alone because I've given you godly friends to walk with you and to try and figure this out. And God was reminding me of this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that gift of friendship, understood how important it is to have godly friends around us, those, those friends who put God, who put Jesus as the North Star in their life, who said, this is all I'm going to focus on. I am going to only follow Jesus, and I'm going to help raise up my friends. I'm going to support them. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to challenge them. I'm going to champion them. We need to have friends like that. We need to know that God is with us. And you know what? It's not just for us. Remember what Jonathan said, that um, friendships are important because they image God to a broken world? King Nebuchadnezzar recognized it. What did he say? He says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. God has given us gifts, the gift of friendship 
and the gift of himself. And it's so that we can be transformed, so that we can be created by the hands of a master craftsman into what he has designed us to be so that we can have a purpose in this life. And so we need to have those godly friends around us. If you need help doing that, please reach out. Let us help you, it's so important. And if you need to be reminded that you aren't alone, that God is with you, that's why we're here. We pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for those gifts. The gift of friendship, the gift of yourself. Thank you that you are always with us, that you are transforming us to be a reflection of who you are into a broken world. And I pray that you would maybe even stir up in us the desire to reach out to a friend in our life and just say thank you. Thank you for being the gift that God has given me. Father, I pray that what we do and what we say would always honor and exalt you. It's in your name we pray, amen.